Imagine you had a device that could connect your mind to another person's mind. A device that could let you watch a person's dream as if you were watching a movie. That could let you extract their thoughts in the same way you would remove a book from a bookshelf. Now imagine that the mind you are looking into was a troubled mind, a mentally ill family member or friend. What if you could identify the source of their inner suffering? What if you could fight that inner battle for them, provide them a reprieve, however brief, from the torment they have endured for so long? Would you do that for someone you love? If your answer is yes, then let me ask you this. What makes you think that that is your battle to fight? How do you know that this well-intentioned deed wouldn't bring them greater harm? And maybe most importantly, how do you know that you would win that battle? Maybe the chaos of their unconscious mind would contaminate yours, and before you know it, your inner calabash merges with the fountain of effervescent roots. A million frogs between ponds evolve into soulful chimpanzees. The firmament becomes our eyes, and the sky and water become a static maelstrom, which you know is the undiscovered country of 1999. <laughs> Imagine you had a device that could connect your mind to another person's mind. This is the central concept behind what is probably the trippiest anime, nay, the trippiest form of fiction I have ever seen. Paprika. I give this commendation as somebody who frequently studies psychological theory and its application in media. I have never seen a work of art that so effectively captures the mechanics and the infinite multiplicity of the human mind, in all of its colorful beauty and its malignant horror. And even though Paprika examines both extremes, the film somehow maintains a sense of whimsy and joy throughout, usually by accompanying the more horrific scenes with images often found in children's fantasy or by symbolizing something dark with something charming. It's a contrast of opposites that would usually only make sense in a dream or nightmare, and not in a narrative. Yet somehow, Paprika makes it sensical and entertaining. This was such a welcome surprise for me, because in all honesty, I had avoided this film for the longest time. And it's all because of the man responsible for bringing this film to life, Satoshi Kon. I avoid his works not because I dislike them. In fact, I don't think there's anything about his works that I think is bad. No, I avoid them because they, with no hint of exaggeration, terrify me to my core. Allow me to put this into proper context. Out of the hundreds of movies, games, and books that I have consumed in my life, the number that have deeply disturbed me rank in the single digits. Of those works, Two of them are Perfect Blue and Paranoia Agent, the only two works by Satoshi Kon that I had experienced up until recently. In offensively simple terms, Perfect Blue and Paranoia Agent terrified me because they manipulate the audience's understanding of what is real and what isn't. Though there are other famous auteurs who have done the same, like David Lynch or Salvador Dali, what distinguishes Kon is his ability to make the audience feel weak and vulnerable for their misperception. For example, Paranoia Agent, but more so Perfect Blue, are all about how people willingly project false versions and interpretations of reality in order to maintain mental stability. In other words, a convenient falsehood is often preferable to a painful truth. But of course, lies always have unintended consequences, and in the worst cases, lies will hurt the innocent. When I tried to analyze both works, I fell into Satoshi Kon's trap both times. I projected many false interpretations and soon realized that I was doing the very thing that Paranoia Agent and Perfect Blue were criticizing. Both times, I had to endure a period of painful self-reflection, a type that no other work of fiction provoked within me. So when my viewers told me that Paprika was a continuation of Kohn's technique, I naturally tried to avoid it. But like I said before, 
When I was convinced by other people to watch Paprika, I was delighted to find that, unlike the other two, this film is a union of extremes. Though there is horror here, Paprika offsets that horror with optimism. Paprika offers solutions, albeit subtly, to that weakness, to that human tendency to falsify reality in order to bear it. And to my delight, those solutions accurately reflect concepts and methods that appear frequently in psychology. I will provide a spoiler-free analysis of those concepts and methods in a moment, but before I do, allow me to give a brief synopsis for those who know nothing about Paprika. In the near future, an institute for psychiatric research is close to completing development on a device known as the DC Mini. This device would allow medical experts to peer inside the minds of their patients in order to provide mental health treatment more effectively. The device has yet to be approved for widespread use, mainly because it lacks access restrictions. In other words, if the device fell into the wrong hands at this point in development, an ill-intentioned person could easily corrupt untold numbers of minds. Despite this danger, one of the doctors at this institute, a woman named Atsuko Chiba, has taken a DC Mini to use on her patients, which she uses with some success. In one example, the one that we see at the beginning of the film, Chiba counsels a detective named Toshimi Konakawa, who has been experiencing the same recurring dream for a while now. When she does this, however, she uses an alter ego, partially to avoid prosecution if she is ever discovered using this unapproved technology. The name of this alter ego is Paprika. Later on, the company Chiba works for discovers that not one, but two DC Minis have been stolen. One, obviously, was taken by Chiba, but the other was taken by an unknown quote-unquote terrorist. Soon after this discovery is made, employees at the Institute start to speak in nonsensical language and engage in dangerous behavior. This is because the person who stole the DC Mini is able to manipulate the minds of those who have come into close proximity with the DC Mini technology. In this way, their brains are like wireless computers which can be hacked by the DC Mini, another wireless computer. It is up to Chiba and the inventors to discover who stole the technology and what their motives are for doing so, before more people lose their minds. Naturally, because the protagonists are all people who worked on the DC Mini, their brains are more vulnerable to the terrorists' whims. Normally, the terrorist tries to halt their progress in one of two ways. They either try to alter the protagonist's perception of reality in the hopes that they might do something lethal, or they try to make them conscious of their deepest fears, in the hopes that emotional pain will deter their journey. Early on in the film, the audience is blessed to know when this blending of reality is happening. We can comfortably and briefly reflect on what it would be like to be faced with such a scenario, where we couldn't tell what was real and what wasn't. But as the film progresses, Satoshi Kon uses various narrative and visual techniques to make the audience feel like victims of the terrorist as well. The first time you watch this film, there will be a number of times where you think what you're seeing is real, only for your belief to be shattered. In a couple of circumstances, you won't ever be sure whether or not what you're seeing is real. Again, Cone provokes that same feeling of vulnerability like he did in Perfect Blue and Paranoia Agent. And I gotta be honest, I was briefly reminded of those disturbing feelings that I thought I had finally overcome. Thankfully, my fears were quickly dashed, because I understood early on that Satoshi Kon was trying to communicate a solution to those fears through his imagery. See, as a student of psychoanalysis, I suspected early on that Satoshi Kon was familiar with the psychoanalytic theory of Freud and Jung, a hypothesis that was confirmed when I started to do research for this video. Kon, like the psychoanalysts, suspected that the dream is the language of the unconscious mind. Instead of using human-invented language like English or Japanese, the unconscious mind unveils our deepest needs through symbolic form, through dreams. And it is by interpreting that symbolism that we might find a solution for our deepest fears. 
Cohn adopts the unconscious mind's method with his imagery. Here's a few examples. In Paprika, when the products of one person's unconscious mind, or the unconscious minds of many, begin to invade one person's conscious perception, it will take the form of tree roots. This is because tree roots extend into the Earth's surface. The top part of the tree represents the known, the conscious, while the bottom part, where the tree roots reside, represent the unknown, the hidden, the unconscious. Though not confirmed, I believe there is another image of the unconscious in this film, one we see on a couple of occasions, that of the Sphinx. To be more specific, this image of the Sphinx is a depiction from the ancient Greek play Oedipus Rex. In that play, the Sphinx was tasked by the gods with killing the people of Thebes for either their crimes or the crimes of their king and or nobles. If you encountered the Sphinx, the only way you could survive is if you solved one of her riddles. If you answered incorrectly, the Sphinx would kill you. In my mind, the Sphinx, with her differing, paradoxical parts, represent the terrifying multiplicity of the unconscious mind. And the riddles the Sphinx gives parallel the language of the unconscious mind. If you are unable to solve the riddle, then the Sphinx, like the unconscious mind, will either corrupt you with fear or kill you or at least kill your mind. But if you do solve the riddle, then you survive. Let's apply this ethic to the movie. We get hints at the deepest fears and insecurities of the main characters early on. For Kanakawa, his deepest fear has something to do with movies. For the creator of the DC Mini, Tokita, his deepest fear is somehow related to children and toys. For example, when Tokita shows up in a dream, he takes the form of a toy robot. Chiba's deepest fear is related to her unconscious alter ego, Paprika, and her inability to reconcile that alter ego with her conscious personality. By solving the riddle of these unconscious neuroses, the protagonists will overcome the influence of their unconscious minds and become stronger for it. Of course, in order for this inner dialogue to work out, one needs to treat the unconscious mind and the dream as real to a certain degree as a place where spirits, for lack of a better word, reside at any time. These spirits can rise up from the unconscious, take over our personality, and bend us to their will, just as anger can turn us from a loving person to a violent one, all within an instant. Observing these spirits as real is understandably difficult for some people, particularly those who view the only true reality to be one of objective materialism. To these types of people, they might assume that what Satoshi Kon or Jung referred to as spirits are just randomly firing synapses in our brains, producing illusions with no degree of reality. Whatever the truth may be, I think it is undeniable that, in most if not all cases, our unconscious complexes, our instincts, affect our behavior. We are not in control of them, they control us. Dr. Chiba confronts this very reality when she, at one point in the film, speaks directly to her alter ego. Why do you constantly refuse to listen? I don't get it! You are a part of me, that should be enough! I don't suppose that you've ever considered that you may be a part of me. Even if Paprika is a product of Chiba's mind, and not the other way around, how would Chiba or anybody else be able to tell if the line between fiction and reality conscious and unconscious, is completely broken down. In such a circumstance, the notion that Paprika is fiction and Chiba is real would flip. Again, to avoid the dangers of the unconscious, the answer is to integrate the neuroses, the unconscious complexes that bend us to their will into consciousness. I will analyze how Chiba manages to do this to cap off this video, but before I do, I am issuing a spoiler warning to those who have never seen this film. If you have never watched Paprika, please do. It's only 90 minutes long. Do not spoil a great reveal and a beautiful finale for yourself. Okay, you have been warned. We find out who the culprit is behind the DC Mini's theft. It is the chairman of the psychiatric institute that funded its development, Seijiro Inui. By stealing the DC Mini, 
he will unleash its influence on billions of minds across the globe, making them perceive reality and act within it according to his whims. He is almost successful, gaining a new body and godlike powers at the end of the film. But before his mission is completed, we hear Paprika note a fatal flaw in Inui's plan. There is one aspect of reality that he is keeping unconscious, and that unconscious element will bend him to Paprika's will. That element is the feminine. As Paprika herself says, reality is made up of opposites. Light and dark, reality and dreams, life and death, and man and woman. To call oneself a god, a creator of reality, without integrating the feminine in oneself by keeping it unconscious, would be inaccurate. Thus, Paprika vows to become a more accurate and thus more powerful god. She combines herself with the bodies of Chiba and Tokita, who is currently in the form of a robot. This produces a child, who then begins to consume Inui's nightmare, which symbolizes the integration of the unconscious, the place where nightmares reside. When Inui's nightmare is fully consumed, the child grows to adult size, and though it has female parts, it also has parts that are undefined, not only signifying that union of man and woman, but symbolizing the union of conscious and unconscious, of reality and dreams. Through this integration, not only Chiba, but we, in real life, can stave off the dangers of the unconscious. Because when we do this, the unconscious no longer controls us. We control it.